Perfect. I guess I look like myself. Okay, welcome everybody. It's good to have you. This is stress talk number two. Remember last month we kind of went through an overview of the history of stress and some of the key players. And today what we're going to start with is looking at the fight or flight response, which remember our inborn kind of survival response. And we're going to look at first a checklist for an overactive response. In other words, is it, is it just revving too much and are we headed for burnout? So that's what we're going to look at today. Let's see if we can move. So these are some of the symptoms. Do you have any of the following symptoms? And I'll try and explain why some of these things happen. Do you tend to overreact to the actions or comments of others, often suspecting their intentions or motivations? Again, remember, fight or flight is survival. So what we do is we see everyone and everything as the enemy. They're threatening our survival. And it's that perception of threat or harm that triggers the fight or flight response. So that's one of the symptoms that we would look for. And of course, this happens a lot in, you know, marriages, of course, where there tends to be a lot of stress over different issues and family issues, um, work situations like these guys here, and et cetera. So uh, second, do you find it hard to experience gratitude, peace of mind, or a positive attitude? Again, when you're running from the proverbial saber-toothed tiger, it's hard to relax, it's hard to be grateful for anything except your legs moving and uh, maybe gaining some ground on that, uh, that uh, saber tooth. Number three, do you tend to focus on fear, mostly anticipating the worst and worrying about the future rather than enjoying the present moment? It, you know, it's, uh, it's true that in fight or flight we're uniquely focused on the now moment, but in a way that it's very hard to experience any joy in the present moment. We want to get away from what we're in, and we're focused on the fear of what might happen to us. So we become an advanced warrior, right? Not warrior, but warrior. So that's one of the signs of a stress response. How about these symptoms? Do you find yourself making bad choices or making lots of mistakes? Now, why would this happen in an overactive fight or flight response? It happens because in fight or flight, the primary physiological reaction is blood flow moves away from your frontal cortex, where all your reasoning powers are and all your well-thought-out well beliefs exist, rational thinking, and it moves to the limbic brain. Remember that limbic center, the, the primitive sort of reptilian, well, not reptilian, but the emotional brain. That emotional brain is a major part of the fight or flight. So when blood flows away from the frontal lobes and the frontal cortex, boom, you're not thinking clearly. You're not doing things rationally. So you tend to make bad choices, make lots of mistakes. Number five, is your life like a series of short-term emergencies for which you find it difficult to really relax and renew your mind, body, and spirit? And again, you understand that because it's a that's what fight or flight is. It's an emergency response that should turn off very quickly when the threat resolves. The problem is, and we'll talk about this more today, the kind of stresses that we experience now are what we call type 2 stresses. And I'll get into the difference between type 1 and type 2 today, but they're difficult to identify, and they're all around us. It's all the time. It's those difficult relationships, toxic bosses, um, traffic jams, things that we cannot just escape from in 10 minutes or beat up and be victorious and move on, right? We can't do that. Do you often feel overwhelmed and burnt out? Remember, although it gears us up for action, noradrenaline, cortisol, epinephrine, all these hormones to get us ready to fight or flee, uh, it, it, it overtaxes the system. And if it doesn't turn off, eventually we get depleted of these critical neurotransmitters and then you get the depression of low neurotransmitters, low norepinephrine, low adrenaline, low dopamine, low serotonin, depression, burnout, overwhelm. How about any of the following? Do you get frequent headaches, stomach upset, high blood pressure, 
back pain and or muscle tension. Remember, mobilizing the muscles is a critical part of fighting or fleeing. You, your muscles are tense. They get geared up for movement. That tension can happen below the conscious, and we don't even realize we're in fight or flight. That's why chronic back pain is so amenable to mind-body techniques. A lot of people that think they need surgery just need to quell the fight or flight response and reduce the, the sympathetic overdrive that leads to muscle tension. Same with headaches and blood pressure. Are you susceptible to frequent infections like colds or the flu, chronic fatigue, depression, and or autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid, arthritis, lupus, and allergies? Why does this happen? Well, in the actual fight or flight response, when it's fully activated, the cortisol levels go very high um, to, to mobilize the system for emergencies, and that suppresses the immune system. So we end up with a suppressed immune system initially, and then after time, that immune system can actually stay in overdrive, and it becomes sort of a hypervigilant immune system, and that's where we get the autoimmune issues, rheumatoid, lupus, that the, the immune system is so in overdrive, it starts attacking itself. It starts attacking your own body instead of the foreign elements. Number nine, do you often experience shortness of breath, hyperventilation, shallow breathing, deep sighing, increased sweating, cold, or clammy hands? These are all signs, again, of that fight or flight. The breathing is rapid. The respiratory rate increases. The heart rate increases. Um, we're trying to hyperventilate to get more oxygen to the system. And... Um, the sympathetic overdrive causes the sweaty palms, etc. Do you get any of these symptoms? Do you frequently experience a lack of focus? Remember, that's blood flow to the frontal lobes, um, frontal cortex. Anxiety, which is a direct result of norepinephrine, which is the primary fight or flight neurotransmitter. Racing thoughts, restlessness, irritability, depression. Remember, depression is kind of a late phase thing of fight or flight. In the moment, you're acutely aware and focused, but after a while, if you get that chronic type 2 stress that just doesn't turn off, it depletes all those neurotransmitters, and then you're left with uh, a depression. Tiredness, hopelessness, anger, again, is primary a fight or fear, flight, sadness, etc. Number 11, do you often have an increased heart rate and or irregular heartbeats, arrhythmias? We know that these do respond very well to mind-body techniques. Frequent arrhythmias, rapid heart rates, because when you calm the central nervous system, the fight or flight triggers sympathetic nervous system, which increases the heart rate. So when you learn techniques for the relaxation response, the, the, the body's sort of inborn antidote to the fight or flight, then you can lower the heart rate, lower the respiratory rate, lower the oxygen consumption, et cetera. And number 12, are you susceptible to irritable bowel syndrome or symptoms, stomach upset, diarrhea, heartburn, and or GERD, esophageal reflux, or reflux esophagitis? Why would these things happen? Remember, in fight or flight, noradrenaline triggers that response where you're running or fleeing or fighting, and it shunts blood away from the gastrointestinal tract. Because in an emergency, your body doesn't worry about digesting food. It wants all that blood going to the muscles and to the limbic system, the, the brain stem to keep you active, alert, aware, in fear, running, fighting, etc. So when blood is chronically shunted from the GI system, you, know, you get a lot of GI symptoms intestinal symptoms. So that's kind of a quick checklist of some of the things we need to think about that can let us know if we're in fight or flight. So now let's look at this common denominator in all stress-related disease. What is the fight or flight response? It is the body's hardwired, automatic, and unconscious response that prepares the body to fight or flee. And down here you see virtually all stress-related medical psychological, hormonal, and addictive disorders 
are related to an overactive fight or flight response. Not all caused by, but related to, can be worsened or exacerbated by chronic fight or flight. And this is a well-known figure. It's closer to the 80% range, but between 50 to 80% of all visits to the doctor are for stress-related problems. So you see this is that common denominator in virtually all the medical world. Now what happens when we feel threatened? When we feel threatened, now you see this is the brain stem right here, and what happens there, once we, whether a real event or an imagined one, that threat or perception of threat triggers an activation of the fight or flight response, which causes nerve cells in what we call the locus ceruleus here in the brain stem to release the norepinephrine that stimulates virtually every cell in our body to prepare for fight or flight. Now simultaneously, another area of our brain, the hypothalamus, which is right about here, initiates nerve cell firing, sympathetic nerves go to the adrenal gland, release epinephrine, a norepinephrine, and cortisol. The hormones from the hypothalamus, the ACTH, goes to the adrenal glands, releases cortisol, the fight or flight hormone. So what are the bodily signs of fight or flight? When fight or flight is triggered or switched on, the body undergoes a series of very dramatic changes. Increased respiratory rate to move more oxygen. Increased heart rate to move blood to your muscles. Increased blood pressure to pump more blood around per minute. Increased muscle tension to gear up for action. Remember we talked about shunting of blood away from the digestive tract so it goes to the muscles and limbs. A decreased blood flow to the prefrontal cortex. That's where we get the mistakes and the, the, um, the poor uh, rational, lack of rational thought, just a reactivity. We react to everything instead of respond. Um, dilation of the pupils, we're sharpening of the sight, we lose the perception of pain. We all know that, right? We, you, especially as we get older, you wake up, where did I get that bruise from? What is that? Right? You, all the time. And so it's kind of, kind of when you're in that moment, your consciousness is elsewhere. You don't perceive the pain. Depression of the immune system, the sweating to help cool off the body, and a change in the brain waves to what we call alpha, I'm, I'm sorry, to, away from alpha waves. Alpha are the relaxed waves, but a change in brain waves during fight or flight that is opposite of the alpha relaxed brain waves. Now, what are the psychological signs of fight or flight? Because the mind also undergoes a similar series of very dramatic changes. We scan and search the environment looking for the enemy and we tend to say it's his fault, it's her fault, it's their fault. Never me. That arrow never points back to us, right? Um, we narrow our focus to things that can harm us. And anger and fear become the kind of lenses through which we see the world. So you have to ask how many of us have been hurt by people who were overstressed in life? Happens all the time, right? It's usually the cat. Somebody kicks the cat, right? But if they're not so nice, they kick you instead of the cat. And uh, that, that begins the, the problems in the world. Um, blood flow shifts from the prefrontal cortex where reason and thought occurs to the limbic system. Why does that happen? Well, when a car is about to hit you, you don't think about the danger. You don't, you know, calculate he's coming. I mean, you've got to react. And that's limbic system. That's emotional brain. That's reptilian brain, the brain stem. You've got to move out of the way. So the blood shifts from the cortex to our reactive centers. And that same blood flow shift leads to rigidity and inflexibility in our thoughts. So by its very nature, the fight or flight system bypasses our rational mind, where our ability to reason and draw on our well thought out beliefs exist, and we move into attack mode. So you have to say, that doesn't sound so good. What good is the fight or flight response? I mean, is it good at all? Well, of course it is, because it's exquisitely designed to protect us from these guys here, the saber-toothed tigers lurking around us. And there are threats and harms that we do have to be alert for. But when our actual physical survival is threatened, it's a great response to have on our side. Plus, it also, as you see here, it is the force responsible 
for moms lifting cars off their trapped children, for firemen running into blazes. I mean, this is, this is what we draw on to mobilize the best of what we have, but it's short term. You can't maintain it, it's, it, it because then we go into that type two stress, which I'll explain in a minute. So the fight or flight response fuels the very heroism and courage we draw on when we have to protect and defend the lives and values of those we cherish or rise to meet a physical or mental challenge. Boy, I did a lot of cramming in medical school. So, you know, I drew on that fight or flight to keep me up late into the night, right, to study for that test. And, and it does have a purpose. So the two types of stress, type one we call, it's immediate. That tiger's in front of you. That car is approaching you. That person's ready to pounce on you, whether it's psychologically or physically. So that, and it's identifiable. We know who it is. We know what it is. And it's short-lived. It's there. We either talk our way out of the fight. We run our way from the fight. We engage in the fight. And we win or we lose. And it's done. But that's, that can be good stress when it helps us to meet a difficult challenge or overcome an obstacle. And it also can be the adrenaline rush of, you know, catching a great wave or going down the ski slope really well. But it's usually self-limiting, and it definitely becomes destructive if it goes on too long. Now, type 2 stress is a little different. It's not immediate. I mean, when did the traffic jam start that you're stuck in and late for your appointment? You know, how long has the boss been bugging you to do something that's unreasonable or in a toxic work situation? These are, it's hard to identify when it begins and when it ends. It just kind of lingers on and on. And it's hard to identify exactly whose fault is it. I mean, you know, a lot of times in a traffic jam, we get there and we see, oh my God, there's some, you know, moron driving in the wrong lane or, you know, too slow or whatever. But we can't do anything about them. So it's, it's very, it's hard to identify what's going on and it's long lasting. So what are these kind of stresses? They are the daily hassles of living, traumatic life changes, conflicts at work, a toxic boss or, boss or work situation, worrying about our kids, concern about our health. This type of stress is usually unrelenting and does not go away unless we do something about it. So here's the proverbial treadmill, man. The guy's in his suit. He's got his briefcase. I think we all know what this feels like. And uh, what are you going to do? That's, uh, that's life for a lot of us. Um, so we need to find ways to, to manage it. We'll talk about that. But when we face very real dangers to our physical survival or need to protect a loved one or rise to meet a challenge, fight or flight's invaluable. But our saber-toothed tigers today are a threat to our psychological and emotional well-being more than our physical well-being. So we've got the rush hour traffic, we got the missed deadlines, we got the bounce check, and we got the argument with the boss or spouse. But these modern day type 2 stresses trigger the fight or flight system as if our physical survival was threatened. And on a daily basis these toxic stress hormones like norepinephrine and its metabolites flow into our bodies, the excess cortisol, and it, it damages our system for events that pose no real threat to our physical survival. So the big problem today, of course, is that in most cases we can't flee and we can't fight, right? We can't do either of the two things that we were designed to do. And, and what happens when we flee or fight? Tremendous physical activity, tremendous uh, metabolizes the adrenaline away, you get exhausted, you go to sleep, you wake up, you're refreshed, the stress is over, and you're fine. But we can't do that. Our modern-day saber-toothed tigers, we have to sit in our office and control ourselves. We have to sit in traffic and deal with it, and we have to wait until the bank opens to handle the bounce check. In short, we feel trapped, right? We can't flee, we can't fight, and it causes us to become aggressive, hypervigilant, and overreactive. We act and respond in ways that are paradoxically counterproductive to our emotional and mental survival. So we need to be able to open that door, right, and get out of this situation.
Now, the downside of fight or flight, I love this woman. Look at, I mean, she's ready to go at the boss here. Look at, look at that look in her eyes, man. It's going to feel good, isn't it? <laughs> to just get back at it. You can identify it, right? But it's counterproductive to punch, to punch out the boss when she or he activates her fight or flight. It might bring temporary relief, but not long lasting. Counterproductive to run away. We can't run. We can't fight. So here we are where, where fight or flight is activated and our hardwired automatic unconscious response causes behavior that can be self-defeating and work against our emotional, psychological, and spiritual well-being. So if stress is unrelenting, what happens, of course, is it becomes impossible to feel gratitude. It becomes, we become focused on fear. Making clear choices and recognizing the consequences of those choices is very difficult because our rational minds disengage and burnout is inevitable. But that's what motivates most of us to get help. So you end up at the doctor's office. This is where I end up seeing so many people, stress-related symptoms, burnout, whether it's depression, anxiety, blood pressure, um, you know, stomach problems. This is where they all show up. We get burned out, and then we finally get some help. We assess. We, we, we reassess our life's priorities, and we take a look at the big picture, examine our choices, examine our attitudes and our beliefs, and uh, start to make some changes. And of course, stress is a tremendously personal experience, right? Because we've got these neurological, hormonal, and chemical reactions that are identical in every one of us, but what's very personal about it is what triggers it in you and me. What somebody says to you may not sort of touch any sensitivity in your background or, or growing up or development, but in somebody else, it may feel like it was a direct attack, right? So these parts of ourselves are, are very different. And then the physiology is very different. So not only what triggers it, but how well do we metabolize the norepinephrine and the adrenaline? How well do we make a, a molecule called SAMe, which helps to metabolize away norepinephrine? And we'll talk about the nutrition after this. Those are things that are very individual, biochemically different from person to person, and it makes a tremendous difference in how we deal with stress. And then also, when you look at stress as a personal experience, look at these definitions that I love for stress. And this, this I, you know, I came up with this definition 20 years ago. I says, stress is the gap between expectations and reality. So if we're expecting things to go a certain way and they go differently, that makes us adapt to the change. It causes tremendous stress. Well, you can see how personal that is because everybody's expectations are different. And <clears throat> unbelievably enough, everybody's reality is different. I mean, we do see things differently. You would think if everybody sees the same event occur, that everybody would see the same thing, but we know from, <clears throat> you know, accidents and police reports, and I mean, you can have five people see the same thing, and it's like that elephant, right? There's so much going on. The guy feeling the leg says it's the proverbial elephant, you know, Four different guys feeling different parts of the elephant. Oh, it feels like a, you know, a pole. Oh, the guy feeling the tail, it feels like a snake. The guy feeling the, the, the ears, it feels like a, you know, flat surface. I mean, it doesn't really, reality is complex and we don't see it all at once. And then stress is also the balance between what you have to do and the resources you have to do with it. Well, our resources change moment to moment. I mean, we start out the day feeling... <laughs> maybe feeling like we have a lot of resources to deal with stuff, by 5 o'clock, where we're worn a little thin, right? We don't have as much reserve left. So, <clears throat> so how do we turn off the fight-or-flight response? How do we flip that switch from on to off? Well, by its very design, remember, um, it's intense physical activity that turns it off best. That's why exercise is so, so helpful. Now, the other thing that happens is the body has an inborn, hardwired, physiologic response that we talked about last month called the relaxation response. This was discovered by cardiologist Herbert Benson, and it's an area in our hypothalamus in the brain 
that exactly counteracts what the fight or flight does for us. It's the inborn antidote. And in cats, you can actually trigger a part of the hypothalamus that triggers the fight or flight, and you can stimulate another part electrically that reduces it, turns it off. It's like the off switch. It counteracts that fight or flight. So we all have that within us, and we're going to learn the different ways that we can evoke that fight or flight response, I mean the relaxation response. Now also nutritional supplements can help neutralize many of the toxic effects of an overactive fight or flight response. So is excess fight or flight a health danger? There's no question about it. The evidence is overwhelming, mostly in type 2 stress that over time, excessive levels of the noradrenaline, adrenaline, and cortisol lead to disorders of our nervous system, which lead to headache, irritable bowel, blood pressure, risk for heart attack, and disorders of our hormonal and immune system, which lead to susceptibility to infection, fatigue, depression, and autoimmune diseases. So let's look at some fight or flight related disorders. Increased muscle tension, we talked about that, Changes in breathing, increased heart rate, lead to irregular heartbeats, decreased blood flow to the prefrontal cortex, which leads to lack of focus, anxiety, racing thoughts, depression, shunting of blood away from digestion, irritable bowel symptoms, diarrhea, heartburn, reflux, increased inflammation in the coronary arteries, leads to heart disease and MI, and weakened immune system, more colds, flus, bronchitis, and autoimmune disorders. So we've got to look at stress as a wake-up call, right? So to protect ourselves in this world of psychological rather than physical danger, we must consciously wake up to the unique signals, letting us first know, are we in fight or flight? And if we are, we look at these alarm symptoms, the physical symptoms like tension, headache, upset stomach that we talked about, and the emotional symptoms. And if we have a lot of them, we need to do something to counteract that whether it be exercise, whether it be changing our nutrition, whether it be learning how to evoke the relaxation response, learning how to meditate, do yoga, we then need to do something or we're inevitably going to end up at burnout and overwhelm. So if you look at stress as a barometer for change, we need to change the effect that unchecked fight or flight has on our body. And we need to change our underlying attitudes and beliefs because this is where therapy also helps tremendously because remember if, if stress is the gap between our expectations and reality, if we have some really unrealistic expectations, wow, we're set up for a lot of pain in life. We're set up for a lot of fight or flight overload. And of course, most of therapy is a, 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 an attempt to sort of change the meaning of what we believe about our lives. That if there's not some change in the meaning of what we experience in life or believe about ourselves or others, then we're going we're, we're gonna to continue to sort of uh, create the same problems. So when you're in this yellow zone before you hit the red zone, that's the ideal time to start, start managing stress. And it works. We have medical research that shows stress management techniques have a positive impact on high blood pressure heart failure, coronary artery disease, insomnia, pain, fibromyalgia, arthritis, incontinence, recovery from surgery, nausea for chemotherapy, allergies, asthma, skin conditions, diabetes, IBS, breathing problems, and post-stroke and post-MI rehab. So now I want to briefly cover some of what we uh, talked about in the um, notice today for the talk, the advanced nutritional support. So what can we do on a nutritional level to help us overcome an overactive fight or flight response? So this is just a summary of what it is, again, that unconscious nerve cell firing and chemical release. But here's the key. Everything starts with norepinephrine from the locus ceruleus in the brainstem. And again, I'll show you, this is the brainstem here that goes down into the spinal cord. It's lit up right now. Right about there is that locus ceruleus. And unconsciously, when we perceive threat, it re releases tons of norepinephrine that activate virtually every cell 
and every system in the body. So that's the key is norepinephrine. This is the predominant neurotransmitter, norepinephrine, a pretty simple molecule, a little benzene ring, a couple hydrogen oxygen atoms, and nitrogen here. This is the release that ignites our genetically hardwired fight or flight. Now the goal in nutritionally supporting a healthy fight or flight is to have just the right amount of norepinephrine to do its job. And what's its job? Keep us alert, aware, attentive, reacting quickly, and yet quickly metabolize away any excess norepinephrine so that toxic metabolites do not build up and we don't head for burnout. Now some of this is going to be a lot of chemistry, but I'll explain it in a simple way. So don't worry about the complex, you know, arrows and circles and weird things, okay? So how is norepinephrine metabolized? If it's produced, then the way to nutritionally support it from overwhelming us is to find out ways to metabolize it quickly. So it's there when we need it, but it doesn't stick around too long. So there are two key enzyme systems that metabolize norepinephrine. One is this thing called COMPT, catechol o methyltransferase. Now this enzyme is seen here and also here and here. So we're looking to get norepinephrine from this location all the way over to here to VMA, vanillomandelic acid, which is its final metabolite, which no longer triggers fight or flight. It's sort of an inactive metabolite of norepinephrine. So to get from here to here, there's only two enzymes, MAO, which is monoamine oxidase, which goes this way, and COMP, which goes this way. But the COMP relies on, oh, that's okay. Got it? <laughs> okay. The COMPT relies on having SAMe, which is a natural amino acid, as a methyl donor. A methyl group is simply a carbon and three hydrogen atoms. And all you need to know is that for COMPT to do its job, for this enzyme to metabolize norepinephrine, it needs to have a carbon and three hydrogen atoms. It needs to have a methyl group. And where does it get that methyl group? It gets it from SAMe, this natural amino acid. So how else is norepinephrine metabolized? You saw here it can go to VMA, but norepinephrine can also be metabolized into epinephrine, adrenaline. Now, what's the difference between norepinephrine and, and epinephrine? They're both uh, what we call excitatory neurotransmitters. They both give us awareness and alertness. But epinephrine is very quickly metabolized away on its own. It tends not to have a lot of toxic metabolites that build up in the system creating damage to our nervous system, to our brain thinking, to our functioning. So metabolically, epinephrine is quickly metabolized. So the question is, how does norepinephrine go into epinephrine? Well, it's another enzyme called phenylethanolamine and methyltransferase, but this enzyme requires SAMe as a methyl donor. So you start to see the picture. SAMe is a critical player here in making sure that norepinephrine either goes off to VMA or it comes down here to epinephrine. Either way, it helps to shorten that fight or flight overstimulation. So how is SAMe made in the body? SAMe is naturally made from an amino acid here that we get in our diet called methionine. Methionine is converted with an enzyme into SAMe right here. Now, the key thing to remember is that SAMe levels become depleted, may become depleted from sickness, stress, or age. So as we age, as our resistance gets lowered over time, or from chronic stress, or illness, or fighting off viruses we don't even know we have, SAMe can become depleted. Now it can also become depleted from poor diet. If you can't digest your proteins well or you don't eat enough proteins, you're not going to absorb enough methionine to be made into SAMe. There's one other thing that's, that's very important here. This reaction from methionine to SAMe, which is this is, the, this is the magic molecule that we want, this requires ATP. If you remember from our talk on energy and the mitochondria, 
ATP is the energy currency of the body. In other words, you have a dollar bill, but if you go to France, you can't buy anything with a dollar bill. You need to turn it into euros. So you need to convert energy in one form into another. Our body needs to convert the calories we take in our diet from fats, carbohydrates, and proteins into ATP. Now, once we have ATP, this ATP requires magnesium in order to be activated to, 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 um, to convert methionine into SAMEs. So ATP that's shown here is actually magnesium ATP. And every enzyme in the body that utilizes or synthesizes ATP requires magnesium. So now we've got another key player. We've got SAMe and we've got magnesium. And magnesium is a mineral that we'll find out in a few minutes is also becomes deficient with stress or age or illness. So we've got two things that can become depleted or poor diet if we don't eat enough uh, magnesium containing foods, mostly vegetables, green vegetables, etc. So we've got now two key molecules that are going to help us, SAMe and magnesium, that can both become depleted. Now why is SAMe helpful? We know because it helps metabolize noradrenaline, but there's also some other reasons. This is my professor, Dr. Gant, and he wrote a book called The Grand Unified Theory of Mind-Brain Function. And SAMe is a methylator, and again, magnesium is also important. What SAMe and magnesium do is if you consider fight or flight as an abscess, that's a metaphor he uses. I'm going to use a different one like a clogged drain. But this is a nice, ab a nice metaphor because SAMe and magnesium lance the norepinephrine abscess of fight or flight. So it does it through that comp enzyme, and it does it by helping to convert norepinephrine to epinephrine, which is more quickly metabolized. And then magnesium, we're going to learn, also is important for why the stress response begins in the first place. So not only is it required to make SAMe, but it also has a direct effect. So SAMe and magnesium here help methylate away excess norepinephrine, draining the abscess of fight or flight, and the subsequent burnout and sustained anger and fear that inevitably result. So how else is SAMe helpful? In addition to methylating away norepinephrine, SAMe is required for the synthesis of a couple very important neurotransmitters. You can see methyl donation, which is, is what SAMe does, is required for the production of dopamine. And what is dopamine? It's a neurotransmitter associated with pleasure and reward centers in the brain. This is the do dopamine is the neurotransmitter of addiction. Virtually everybody who's addicted to any drug or any behavior, whether it's the shopping um, or gambling, or whether it's just uh, cocaine or heroin, it creates an immediate rush of a, a dopamine in the brain, which gives this incredible sense of pleasure and high. And then what happens? It goes back to its normal levels very rapidly, and that decrease, that rapid decline in dopamine is what causes the craving. That's what causes the addiction. That's what causes wanting more. So. SAMe helps to make sure that dopamine levels remain relatively steady and, 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 and available to the body. SAMe also helps and is necessary in the production of 5-HT, which is serotonin. And we all know of serotonin through SSRIs, right, the, the natural antidepressant in the body. Prozac, Lexapro, all these SSRIs work to increase the, the, the active amount of serotonin in the body. What they do is they keep it in the synapse longer, so they make serotonin go from an inactive to an active form. That's what SSRIs do. But another way to improve your levels of serotonin is through SAMe. And serotonin has a moderating, calming effect on the mind and body, definitely reducing stress. So it's a very important player. And that's why SAMe has been so, so effective in treating depression in just hundreds of clinical studies. 
And at doses of about 400 milligrams twice a day, it's remarkably reliable and it works very, very quickly. It probably works within a week or two for most people rather than the four to six weeks that most SSRIs take. Now, uh, SAMI also helps the production of norepinephrine. So you might say, well, you told me norepinephrine is bad, right? Well, it's not bad. It's bad if it stays around too long. So it has a self-regulating effect. So even though SAMI helps to improve norepinephrine levels, it also helps metabolize them away quickly into either VMA or onto epinephrine, which is quickly metabolized. But the key to remember is that you can see why SAMI is such a great molecule for depression, for inattentiveness, for many, many things, because you get nice levels of dopamine, nice levels of serotonin, nice levels of norepinephrine, which if you're not in chronic fight or flight, hey, that's a great neurotransmitter to have around. Norepinephrine levels are critically important to thinking clearly, to not feeling depressed. In fact, very, very low norepinephrine, you know, at the final burnout stage, it, you know, is, is very uh, depressing. I mean, we can tell if that level is under a certain amount, it, it, people are just suicidal. And you can almost tell if somebody's going to be suicidally depressed if their norepinephrine levels are really, really low past a, a certain minimum point. I, this diagram is important because I want to show you a couple other things that are critical from, that, that come from this American Journal of Clinical Nutrition article. Uh, folic acid and B12 are also essential in this process of helping, um, uh, you can't see it here, but what they help is um, uh, homocysteine go into methionine, which goes into SAMe. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the importance of B12 and folic acid as well as B6 in the next slide. So here's a little more complicated slide, but remember, SAMe levels can become depleted from sickness, stress, heavy metal toxicity, age, um, et cetera, as well as magnesium. I could just as well put magnesium in here. So let's look at this diagram. A lot of you know that I measure your homocysteine levels because this is a marker for vitamin B deficiency, particularly B6, B12, or folic acid because you see for homocysteine to be converted back into methionine, this is called the methylation um, uh, train or the methylation uh, reaction or cycle. Homocysteine has to be, remember we can take in methionine in our diet and that gets converted into SAMe with ATP and magnesium up here. So here's our SAMe. So then when the SAMe donates a methyl group and it gives it away so that norepinephrine can go into epinephrine, then SAMe turns into um, ultimately homocysteine. So this homocysteine now needs to be converted back to methionine so it can be remethylated and make more SAMe. Well, if you're B12 deficient, that homocysteine cannot go this way and it starts to build up to high levels in the body. And that's why high homocysteine is not only reflects problems with B12, B6, and folate, but it means you're almost certainly low in SAMe and low in glutathione, which I'll explain in a minute, which is a major antioxidant. Now, <clears throat> folic acid has to be converted to an active form of folic acid called 5-MTHF, 5-methyltetrahydrofolate, right here, and that's necessary. Both 5-MTHF and B12 are necessary to take homocysteine to methionine. Now, why is this so important? Because a lot of people, and I don't know if you remember when we talked about uh, a genetic testing, a lot of people have a defective MTHFR enzyme, and they cannot convert folic acid into the active form of folic acid. So those people have an, a, a, a decreased ability to do so, and they're really prone to a lot of psychological anxiety, depression, other neurological disorders because this active form is necessary to produce methionine, which produces SAMe, your body's sort of natural antidepressant and anti-stress you know, molecule. 
So what we can do is there are active forms. We now can get 5-MTHF, and you don't have to take folic acid. So if you have never been tested for this genetic defect here, which we, is easy enough to test, but if you don't know, you can take the active form of folic acid, and that will bypass any defect and make sure that all these methylation cycle goes well. Now, homocysteine, now there's one other chemical called TMG or betaine, trimethyl. There's our methyl group again. There's three CH3 groups in that trimethylglycine. So that is also another way trimethylglycine can directly give a methyl group to homocysteine and form methionine and then go on to make more SAMe. So B12, B6, I mean B6 here I'll explain in a minute, but active folate, B12, and TMG are essential to help make sure you get plenty of SAMe naturally in the body. Um, now this way homocysteine can also go in this direction um, to form cysteine, which then goes on to form glutathione, which is the body's most abundant antioxidant. It helps us fight infection, helps detoxify heavy metals. It's a critical player for well-being and health. It's the most abundant antioxidant enzyme or, or molecule in the body. So we want B6 to also make sure that homocysteine can go down here. This is called the sulfation cycle. This is called the methylation cycle. So let's talk briefly about magnesium, then we'll put this all together and take your questions. Magnesium is an essential, plays a vital role in the stress reaction, and we know that mental and emotional stress can deplete it, so it's a vicious cycle. Adequate magnesium allows the stress reaction to naturally subside, and I'll explain how in a minute. We also learned one other thing that magnesium does, right? It helps the ATP to convert methionine into SAMe. So magnesium not only has a role in stabilizing cells, but it also helps to create more SAMe to help um, um, methylate away the excess norepinephrine. Magnesium also inhibits the release of norepinephrine from cells. So look here, this is a stress-resistant cell. This is the cell wall, and this is the intracellular space inside the cell, and this is outside the cell. Now, under normal circumstances, there's lots of calcium on the outside of the cell and very little inside. And it's the opposite with magnesium. There's lots of magnesium in the cell and very little outside. Now, this cell is resistant because it has a high magnesium to calcium ratio inside the cell. Lots of magnesium, very little calcium. So, if you have a situation that is opposite, where there's very little magnesium inside the cell, maybe because there's not even enough outside the cell, you've become depleted or you don't take in enough magnesium, that cell becomes unstable and prone to stress. And when this ratio is low to magnesium to calcium inside the cell, epinephrine is released from the cell as well as other, other stress hormones. So you can see that a low magnesium calcium ratio increases epinephrine secretion and it keeps the stress response from subsiding because if there's not enough magnesium outside to go back into that cell and stabilize it, it, it never stops. It, it can't turn itself off. Does that make sense? So in the normal unstressed state, this is where it should be, high magnesium to calcium. But even you can even see how magnesium itself can activate the stress response, even without emotional threat or harm, right? So there's sort of the emotional part of the fight or flight, and then there's all these physiological biochemical stresses that stress the body that are invisible. We wouldn't even know that we could be more susceptible to stress. So this is our next to last slide, and then we'll take some questions. But I like to consider the, the excess buildup of norepinephrine here like a backed up overflowing sink. So we've got this sink that the, the, the faucet's on, it's pouring noradrenaline into the sink, and the sink is clogged, right? It just won't take out the norepinephrine. 
So what do many traditional therapies for the fight or flight response? Now, if we can just turn off the fight or flight with exercise or the relaxation response, we can turn off the water and eventually, hopefully, the sink will clear if it's not completely blocked. But most of us don't really work too much on what's triggering it, so the faucet keeps running. And then a lot of the therapies that we end up going to teach us how to mop up the floor. So we're learning how to mop up the excess norepinephrine to keep it from damaging the, the hardwood and the rest of the body but we haven't done anything to turn off the response. So SAMe and magnesium are the nutritional draino of fight or flight. They open up this drain, let the clog open up, let the excess norepinephrine be drained away, and then we can simultaneously start working on, hey, let's turn the volume down on that fight or flight, let's lower it, may not turn off completely because we do have to go to work, we do have to drive on the freeways, we can't turn off all the stress, but we can find ways. And we can certainly find moments when we can turn off a lot of the stress. You know, we can take 10 minutes to unwind or listen to a nice piece of music or take a walk in the woods or walk the dog or whatever. So those, so, so many interventions help to limit the release of and the damaging effects of norepinephrine, but very few except the nutritional can help to metabolize it away. So we can stop the fight or flight from being activated, stop the release of norepinephrine, and also everything that we talked about, I think we talked about it in the last month, we did. All those other therapies that activate the frontal lobe, like visualization, meditation, mindfulness therapy, or, or cognitive therapies, all those things do help moderate that locus ceruleus and keep it from releasing as much norepinephrine. So it does kind of turn down the faucet, but it doesn't help us to do anything with the norepinephrine that's already been produced. For that, we really need to go to some of to SAMe and magnesium and all the things that make it work. So on this last slide, I'm going to tell you about the, but this is, this is my personal formula that I came up with based on the research that I've been doing and the presentation that I just give you, it we're going to call it the Stress Buster 180 because I came out with the 180 capsule version. And I like the sound of that, Stress Buster 180, like we're turning that stress around, right? It really was because there were 180 capsules in the bottle. But, you know, sometimes good things happen for the wrong reason. So let me go through what's in here and explain what we've put in one pill. Um, you have to take more than one pill, but it's all... it's. <laughs> yes, yeah, I've made up this formula and we have it produced for us, right. So I came up with this formula. So what it is is we use the magnesium at 400 milligrams and we're very careful to use this Albion Labs. Dwayne Ashmead is the founder of Albion Labs. I've been following them for 20 years. Nobody makes chelated minerals like he does. A chelated mineral, if you just take magnesium oxide, which is the thing you usually find in the store, it's very poorly absorbed. It would be like swallowing a, a nail to get iron in your system. You know, if you eat iron inside of meat, boy, it, it's really highly absorbed because that iron is surrounded by amino acids. That's what chelated magnesium is. Every molecule on an individual level is surrounded by amino acids, so it gets absorbed as if it's a food. So we only use this very highly Obviously, it's more expensive, but if you're not going to get the job done, I, I, to me, it's not worth doing. So we use the chelated magnesium at a dose of 400 milligrams per six capsules. We use SAMe at the 800 milligram dose, which is where most of the clinical studies show that it does its major effect on depression. SAMe also has a really nice benefit of it helps joint pains and cartilage pains, helps to regrow cartilage. It stimulates through whole another mechanism, chondrocytes to help regrow cartilage, probably even better than glucosamine and chondroitin does. Then we add the active B12 at a very high dose, methylcobalamin, not cyanocobalamin. We add the active folate, the 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate at a very high dose. We add the active B6, which is not paradoxine, but paradoxal 5-phosphate. And then I added in some of the TMG, remember the three methyl groups, 
trimethylglycine at 1,000 milligrams, which is a very um, respectable a functional dose of TMG or betaine anhydrous. So for most people, what we recommend is starting with two to three capsules in the morning. It's better to take it before meals because SAMI is a highly reactive molecule. And if you take it with food, it tends to get, it doesn't upset your stomach, but it tends to get um, altered and it, it can't, it, it, it uh, decreases its effectiveness. So it's better on an empty stomach. This is one of those cases. So two to three capsules once a day in the morning, 20 minutes before meals. I would say if no response within a couple weeks, two to three weeks, then you would increase it to three capsules before breakfast and three capsules before lunch would be ideal. You could also do it before dinner. Um, and then a maximum dose, I would say nine capsules a day. Um, the SAMI, you can go up to 1,200. In some cases, you'll go higher. But I, I wouldn't recommend going too high. Now, the downside of all this formula is SAMI is a very expensive molecule. If you buy SAMI, um, that alone for a month's supply at the 800 milligrams is probably over $50 at most places. You might find it on sale now and then, but it's not a cheap molecule, um, nor are these active forms of the, the B vitamins. So look, this is a formula that for people who are really suffering significant effects from stress, it's a wonderful thing to do. If you're working through things, if you're going through particularly stressful times, you know, challenging relationships or job changes or life changes that are dramatic, you know, this would be a great formula that we came up with to support it without you having to get, because normally you'd need to get a bottle of magnesium and take three to four capsules. You'd need to take two capsules of 400 milligram SAMe. You'd need to take, you know, a capsule of B12, a capsule of folic acid, a capsule of B12, and two capsules of TMG because it's 500 milligrams a capsule. There's a lot of capsules, a lot of bottles, a lot of stuff, and it's hard to find. And so this is a formula that, um, that we're really excited about and I think fits, kind of you understand how it fits into the, into the picture. And uh, so that's it for the official chat and uh, informational session. Do you guys have any questions or comments? Right. Yeah, it, it is true. We probably, there is a chance you could take too much calcium. I mean, that's why I've tended to recommend for most people a little bit of extra calcium, you know, somewhere in the 600 to 900 range. Most of us get about 500 to 600 in our diet daily. And you want to supplement maybe, you want to have a total of about 1,000 to 1,200 or 1,500, depending on if you have osteoporosis and stuff. But yeah, the body, <coughs> excuse me, does tend to excrete extra calcium through the kidneys. So you, you can throw off the ratios, though, if you're, if you're getting too much. But most people with healthy kidneys can work it out. The problem is that you, most people are mag, magnesium deficient as well, and then that ratio may be thrown off even more. So it's, it's true. Magnesium is mainly vegetables, green leafy vegetables. The, the chlorophyll in mag, in, in, that gives the green color to lettuce and the, the leafy vegetables has magnesium at the center of that molecule. So magnesium tends to come from, from the veggies. Um, but again, if you're talking about depletion, when people start to lose it over a long period of time, it's hard to eat enough lettuce to get it back. I mean, you might get it back and sustain it uh, and then not need to supplement it for a long time, but we actually measure the levels, and you don't want to just measure a serum magnesium. That's not effective. You want to measure a RBC magnesium, how much is inside the red blood cell. It's a different test. Our lab here does it, so whenever I check magnesium, we check RBC magnesium. If it's low, you're going to need to supplement because you're really at risk. Yeah, calcium magnesium usually in a two to one ratio, which is a good ratio. Well, most forms over the counter are like like five hundred of calcium, two hundred fifty mag. You're tell you're saying that there are some that are one to one now. Yeah, one to one. So 
There's another way to get a little more magnesium. But again, you want to look, most of those are magnesium oxide or a magnesium salt that's so poorly, you know, absorbed that it, it, it may not help. I mean, obviously, the best way is foods for anything. What, whatever you get through foods are better. Um, do these drugs... It's interesting, huh? You probably never heard, heard about this stuff. No. Yeah. Do these supplements interact with any of the drugs that they give for psychological disorders? Yes, it is fascinating, yes, that how much in fight or flight, especially when it's chronic and subtle and doesn't turn off, that blood flow just gets shunted away from the, the frontal cortex and you're, you're not, well, we all know in the midst of most fight or flight acute, we're pretty irrational, right? We react, we, you know, that's why like the counting to three and, or ten or all those things, they help, and you're trying to establish a blood. It better it'd be better if you took ten deep breaths than count to ten. You might be able to calm down the 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 system. I know we said we were going to do some of the next month. We'll actually teach you the relaxation response. I'll go into a little more detail about some of the changes that we see, and we'll show you how to evoke the relaxation response as a simple. Uh, meditative technique or breathing technique or however you want to look at it. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll do that next time. And then I did promise you, which I didn't get to this month, more of the kind of placebo studies. We will, maybe I'll, I'll combine that with some more of those, the, the placebo effect and how that works and how fascinating our thoughts and feelings are and how much they can influence our, our biochemistry, how chemical they are. So remember that sham knee surgery where, where the people who got the fake surgery did just as well as the people who got the, the full surgery? So, yeah, so we'll, we'll do more of that. Um, uh, can I yes. ask a question? Yeah, can I ask a question? Right, right, right. There's no question that B12 is dramatically uh, malabsorbed in a large, um, a large number of people, you know, probably 50 and over, but it increases as we age more and more. A lot of it has to do with, you know, intrinsic factor in the stomach and some of the acid. Acid tends to actually decrease as we get older. It's called achlorhydria. There's not as many hydrogen atoms in the stomach to produce an acid environment. And then the proteins don't get absorbed, don't get digested as well, because acid's necessary to start the whole process. So digestive enzymes are one solution. Um, B12, but when you want to supplement B12, um, you can do very high doses orally and you'll probably get enough through. Ideally, for B12, if that's the only deficiency, would be a sublingual. They even have patches now, but you want to get it directly into the bloodstream. Well, I read that a B12 yeah, that's not true. Yeah, the, the sublingual form that you dissolve under your tongue ha goes directly into the bloodstream. It bypasses gastric absorption completely. So, yeah, that's some kind of, you know, mis, you know, misquote. Yeah, it's just not true. Yeah, chewable's fine. I mean, listen, the truth is these... These supplemental forms have thousands of times more than what's needed. So even if you're absorbing 10%, let's say you normally absorb 30% of B12, and as we age, we absorb 5%. Well, if you, you, know, if you give hundreds of times as much, that 5% should still be 
enough in many cases. But a lot of people, we did, you missed the talk last, or a couple months ago, where we talked about the dramatic effect, I mean, that almost 25% of depression in older people could be reversed with B12 injections, period. Mm. Good for you. Wonderful. That's a nice, hefty dose. Perfect. You do. You do. And everybody's different. Everybody's different. But no, that it's, it's a very important point. I think the B12s are a critical player. Thank you. <laughs> I only wish it were true. Yeah, yeah. There, I mean, yeah, B12, you know, listen, it's water-soluble. There is a certain amount of, you know, storage in the body, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not dramatic. You, you need to keep it up on a pretty regular basis. We see so many B12-related problems. And you saw why. You saw how essential B12 in that whole methylation and then the sulfation down the other way going. I mean, you think if SAMe is your kind of natural antidepressant, anti-anxiety, mood lifter, joint rebuilder, I mean, it, without B12 and without folic acid, just it can't make enough. Yeah, I think, if I recall correctly, they were going after the depression because that was the first, and then they found out that, wow, people's joint pains were getting better and all kinds of things, yeah. Is there any, any bad Okay, bad? thank you, everybody. Enjoy your evening. Thanks for coming out. We appreciate it, and we'll see you next month. Yeah. Yeah. What percent <laughs> stress related? You know, I think that number is accurate, fifty to eighty percent. But that's the broad stress thing. You know, I mean, in a very broad fashion, stress leads to eating the wrong foods for comfort, poor lifestyle choices. I mean, when you figure in, it's not direct positive, but indirectly, I mean, look, life, the quality of our life is directly related to how well we manage our stress. I mean, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, Ultimately. Most do. Yes, <laughs> most do. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And that, again, that depends on the physiology. Do you have a lot of SAMe on board? Do you have a lot of magnesium on board? Are your beliefs and expectations and your, you know, are you grounded in... That way, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a physiology and there's a psychology and there's a spirituality, which we didn't even get to, that is probably one of the, the, the more dramatic moderating effects on stress. I mean, a lot of us draw on spiritual beliefs to kind of change our expectations and accept certain things, that whole serenity thing, you know. So, yeah.